Hey guys, Practical Psychology here, and in this video we are going to discuss talent, how to perform effective practice, and the 10,000 hour rule. So talent, are great people really born with a special gift? Before we start, you should know that the author of this book, Anders Ericsson, is the expert of what makes an expert an expert. So he is the leading researcher of what makes people great at what they do. Everything we've learned or heard from, deliberate practice, and the 10,000 hours rule in the last 15, 20 years was mostly inspired by his work. So let's begin with an anecdote. Not so long ago, when I used to look at great basketball players like LeBron James and Kobe Bryant, amazing artists like Beyonce and Adele, I used to think that these people were born with more talent than other people. I used to think that they were lucky or that they were gifted. In fact, the author argues that the gift that we are thinking of is actually adaptability, something that we all possess in equal measures as human. People who achieve the most are simply ones who tap into this ability to improve their brain or body better than others. It's very common for us to think that people are gifted because we often look at the finished product. We see those top athletes, artists, or entrepreneurs today and might think that they look so great. How did they get up there? Wow, it's amazing. And we often forget about the fact that Kobe woke up at 5 a.m. for practice for the past 20 years in order to get to where he was now. So if practice is the one and only variable, how should we practice effectively? First, there is naive practice. It's like me driving. The fact that I have been driving for the past five years doesn't make me a better driver than me four years ago. On the other hand, there is purposeful practice. So when Anders first started his experience, he recruited a student by the name of Steve. Steve would come to each session and recite back to him a string of digits using only his short-term memory. Let's say for the first session, the author would recite to Steve a string of digits and Steve was able to recall five. The next one, he would reach six, and then after that, seven. And eventually, Steve would hit a plateau and fail to improve beyond the numbers that he could grow and get frustrated. And eventually, Steve would come, have a breakthrough, and he would recite to 10, 11 digits in a row, but he's still stuck again. During the experiment, the process would happen on multiple occasions, and at the end of the experiment, he was able to recall 82 digits. What I'm trying to illustrate with this example is that Steve was able to achieve these amazing feats using what Anders would break down and call the four proponents of purposeful practice. So, for number one, have a clear goal. This requires us to have a grand vision of how we want to perform, if we want to be our best. And from that vision, we split it down into smaller goals and set objectives for each of those aspects to be realized. It's like a basketball player whose dream is to reach the NBA, and he can aspire to achieve that by working on his free throw, his vertical leap, or his handling skills. And a day-by-day -day goal can simply be to increase the number of free throws in a row at the end of each day of his practice. There's a lot in common with this book with the research of Flow by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. The second component is focus. Like Steve in the experiment, we can achieve great things if we completely dedicate ourselves to the task at hand, one task at hand. He was able to recite 82 digits because during each session, he would come and intensely focus on the experience for a complete hour. When was the last time that you did something deliberately one time, only one thing for an hour? The third component is getting immediate feedback. For the basketball player willing to improve his free throw, he would either beat the number of his last streak or not. To a student, feedback can come as a result he gets on a practice test, whether he scores well or not. Finally, the fourth component is to stretch ourselves out of our comfort zone. By frequently operating at the edge of our ability, we are able to expand and create a new comfort zone. By doing this, this forces us to find creative ways to improve our ability and discover new insights. Just like how Steve grew frustrated and would come back the next day with a new method of how to memorize more digits. And this is called mental representation. Through years of purposeful practice, top performers are able to have complex representations of different situations that happens in their field. For example, when we think about the grandmaster chess player or expert climbers, these people are able to play entire games while blindfolded, which is amazing, and see that the path they will take on a mountain before they actually do it. Mental representation allows people to accurately make predictions based on their past experiences and also retain huge amounts of information related to their field. Now this is really important. I have an ebook coming out soon that has to do with making money and, and I will be explaining tons of my failures in the past that have led up to me be able to have an entirely passive income and do what I love doing. This is because mental representation. I'm able to take my past failures and go, hmm, this is what I shouldn't do, and look at the stuff that worked and go, hmm, I need to do more of this. The third and best type of practice is deliberate practice, a term he has popularized in the last few years. To be able to perform deliberate practice, there are certain requirements, like in a field that has clear expert performers, that we should be able to objectively measure our performance compared to them, and finally be able to determine each steps that it takes to get there. This is definitely the best way to practice, and 
something that we should try to recreate our channels. We learn from experts in our respective fields and we try to replicate their advice or success and over time we measure our improvements based on goals that we have set up for ourselves. So like I said, we learn from experts in our respective fields. I started this channel because I saw Fight Mediocrity's channel and was like, hmm, I can do that better. Also, in this video we realize that the 10,000 hour rule is not even a rule. Doing something over and over and over again does not make us better for a long period of time. We must perform something purposefully or deliberately. So if you want to get better at something, if you want to be the master of your field, you have to be doing it purposefully or deliberately. And basically this breaks down to you being self-aware and you have to be passionate about it. If I wanted to be the best piano player there is, I don't think I could be. In fact, I could accurately say that I will never be, at this point in time, the best piano player. That is because I do not have a passion for playing the piano. I don't spend 8 hours, 10 hours, 15 hours a day learning new chord progressions or how to make something sound better. It's just not going to happen. I don't have the passion for it right now. I might in the future, but right now my passion is making these videos to add value to your guys' life. And that is what I need to be doing because I'm good at it. And it allows me to contribute the most to the world. Just like in the book Managing Oneself by Peter Drucker. Anyways, in the end, if we aspire to reach the peak of our field, all we have to do is have the passion for it and practice deliberately and purposefully. You might not even have to take the 10,000 hour rule into mind. You shouldn't have to focus on numbers. Instead, we should be focusing on the process. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you got one gold nugget out of this video, click the like button, and if you want more book reviews like this, subscribe. Thank you guys so much for watching.